Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Serenity OS login screen. Uh, let me just log in here before we get started. Okay, so welcome to the Serenity OS update for October 2021. And um, first thing I want to do is tell you about sponsorship. So since May of this year, I'm working on Serenity OS full time and my work is entirely funded by viewers and fans of the system. So if you would like to help me continue doing this, there are a bunch of donation options and you can check out links in the video description. Um, and to everybody who's already supporting me in some way, a huge thank you. Uh, this is just a dream come true to be able to work on this stuff full time. And uh, I am eternally grateful for all of the love and support. Um, so let's talk about October. This month, we celebrated the system's third birthday. So of course, I made a happy birthday post, which is tradition. And uh, you can check it out on serenityos.org. I'll put a link in the video description. Uh, and it was a great time just going through the past year and sort of um, rediscovering everything interesting that happened. Um, and uh, this month, Linus is out traveling. So it's just me and the monthly update. So let's just get to it, I guess. Uh, some new stuff. The first thing that you saw there was the login screen, which is new. So we now have a login and logout system. Um, and this was implemented by Peter, who added the login logout stuff and also the GUI and um, did a bunch of supporting changes for that as well. So that's super duper cool. We can now log in as different users. Um, something that we've always in theory supported, but never actually supported. So it's really great to see that actually working now. Uh, so thank you, Peter, for working on that. Uh, and another thing is that um, Andrew went and implemented um, button switching. So you can now switch the primary and secondary buttons if you want. Uh, and this is a system wide setting. So if you are uh, left-handed or right-handed, uh, we can now um, support the button configuration that you actually want to use. So very, very cool work by Andrew. Uh, something I worked on and I made a video about was um, keyboard focus stuff. So uh, if we open up the file picker dialog, um, we can now tab around this dialog with much greater ease because not every dang little thing is a uh, tab target or a focus target. Uh, and it's it's kind of um, a little polished thing, but it's something I'm really happy with. So previously, pressing tab would cycle through each of these buttons and then each of the entries in the tray over here, uh, and then finally get over to the view and text box and so on. And now there's just a tiny number of jumps when you press tab. So you go from here to the view, um, to the text box, to the buttons, and to the tray. And then you've made a lap. Um, and I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, another thing that's new is since we have text editor up, I guess we can open up some text file. Um, so I wanted to show you syntax highlighting changes. So if we open up some HTML, like uh, uh, da, 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 the welcome page. And let's take a look at that. Also, preview is not working for some reason. Let's ignore that. So a thing that's new is CSS syntax highlighting, and it actually works inside HTML documents as well. So um, when you open a style tag, then we uh, switch to CSS syntax highlighting. And this was implemented by Sam. So uh, huge props to Sam for CSS syntax highlighting. It's a great, uh, great thing to finally have. And uh, let's take a look at the browser. So um, something that is really cool that I kept meaning to do but never did, uh, Peter went and did, and it's tab reordering. Uh, this is really awesome. So you can just drag the tabs around. Of course, they're all uh, identical looking now, so that's not... <laughs> Not the best demonstration. Uh, let's do that. Yeah, so you can see you can now move these around as you like. Very, very cool. Uh, thank you, Peter, for working on that. 
And uh, we've done a whole bunch of work on the browser this month um, in terms of spec compliance. And there's been a million things by Luke, Tim, Linus, Idan, Sam, and Tobias, um, and myself. And uh, a lot of that is sort of under the hood stuff that's a bit hard to show. Um, but something that I particularly liked was um, media query support. So if you actually go and check out the um, third birthday post that I mentioned, here it is. It's a subtle thing, but uh, we actually now support these uh, responsive layouts. Uh, so uh, you can see here, if I compress this viewport so that there's not so much page, then it switches to a more compact page layout. And that's done um, via media queries. So that's new in LibWeb. And it was implemented by Sam as well. So that's super cool work by Sam. And I see now that we have process going a bit crazy down here. CPU usage is booming. So let's see who that is. Oh, it's request server. Well, how about we just kill that process? Uh, and um, forget that happened. <laughs> uh, yes, you can see we, we still have bugs. But uh, let's talk about other stuff. So on the topic of browser things, uh, we've also had a whole bunch of development in JavaScript, of course. Uh, and um, in terms of spec compliance, I know that uh, on the test 262, scores were up from about 69% a month ago to almost 72% now um, with the uh, main interpreter. And I've also started working on the bytecode VM again and brought it from 36% compliance to 46% compliance. Uh, but of course, there's still a long way to go before the bytecode VM catches up with the um, the current default VM. So um, work continues on spec compliance. But uh, there's also been some work on new features, of course. So one I wanted to show you was um, Let's, let's do class private, uh, what do they call it? Class private fields, I think. So you can actually declare a private field like this. Um, and then if you want to, well, let's make a get private field function that just returns it. Private field. And maybe we'll have a set private field that sets it to something. So I think that's how you use it. Seems like it. And let's make one of those. So a new C. And now you'll notice that we can't actually access the private field like that. But um, the class member functions can. So you can call class get private field. Um, of course, it's undefined until we actually set it to something. So let's set it to one, two, three. And now if we get it, we get one, two, three. So it's pretty cool. Uh, expanding our support for more of the ECMAScript features. And another thing, I think it's still a stage three proposal, but uh, Linus has started implementing Shadow Realms, which is a, a pretty interesting new feature where you can create sort of um, a completely separate environment, um, execution environment, and then run code inside it, separated from your main execution environment. So it would look something like this. So let's make a Shadow Realm. Uh, and then you can call it evaluate inside this thing. So you can like set a global variable like foo to one, two, three. Um, and now there's a global variable called foo inside of this shadow realm, which is a separate JavaScript execution realm. Um, so it doesn't exist here in our main current realm. Uh, but if we want to, we can, of course, um, get it out like that. Uh, and I think you can't extract, right, you can't actually extract like full objects, you can only extract uh, primitives or functions. So you can also evaluate something that uh, creates a function. So something like this, uh, and then return global list dot one to um, dot foo, for example. So now we are, this creates a, a function that is from inside of that shadow realm. Um, and returns it to us. So we can actually assign that to something and then call it 
and then we execute this code in the scope of the Shadow Realm and extract the global variable foo. Uh, this is all very, very cutting edge stuff, so I'm not super familiar with it, but uh, I'm really, really pleased that uh, libjs is sort of staying on the staying on the cutting edge of um, new JavaScript spec proposals and stuff. So it's super awesome work by Linus uh, with that, and I look forward to seeing uh, more stuff like that. Anyway, um, outside of this, in libjs we've had a ton of uh, great refactoring work this month. Um, because we came up with this way to um, to make it a compile error to not handle uh, exceptions in our C++ code. So if there's a JavaScript exception, uh, we have to we have to check for that in our C++ uh, engine. And previously, uh, you had to remember to do that everywhere. And now we came up with this uh, pattern that uh, makes that checking um, makes it a compiler compile error to not perform that check. And um, now we're sort of refactoring the entire engine to take advantage of that pattern. Um, so Linus and Idan and Tim uh, especially um, have been just doing a huge amount of work taking advantage of that. And they've found lots of places where we would previously um, not notice that we had an exception to take care of. So definitely paying off. Um, OK, so let's look at something else. Uh, a new thing this month is strace pretty printing. So if you run strace on a program, uh, previously we would just print out um, sort of in hexadecimal all of the arguments to each syscall. But uh, Rodrigo went and implemented pretty printing of syscalls. So you can now see exactly what the arguments being passed to the syscalls are. Uh, for example, you can see here that it's opening Etsy pass word um, with these arguments and everything. And previously, we just had like the pointer to the string as a hexadecimal number. So strace was not super interesting before. Now strace is super interesting. So thank you very much, Rajigo, for for taking um, taking care of that. Um, and something else that I really liked was an optimization by Edan. So we discovered that the CPU usage graph down here, uh, which is always on uh, at startup, uh, it was sucking up a huge amount of CPU time. And um, the reason was that it, we were making these really expensive computations to, to learn how much uh, CPU usage was currently going on. And uh, basically, we were... Um, summing up all of the current threads, um, scheduling statistics, and then performing some math on that. And it was just a huge chore. And I think on the 64-bit platform, like x86-64, it was almost 10% of 10% um, of runtime while idle was just spent on um, doing those computations. So very, very silly. And Edan came up with this optimization where, what's it called, proc stat, I think? Yeah. So now instead of going through all of the live threads and summing things up, we just have the kernel expose total scheduling statistics. And then the math becomes a lot easier because we only have these four numbers here to, to think about instead of having to sum everything up ourselves. So thank you very much, Edan, for working on that because uh, it really freed up a lot of resources, uh, especially on 64-bit, where we are quite a bit slower than 32-bit for some reason that we have yet to uh, figure out. Um, and on the topic of processes and stuff, um, I think Rodrigo did is also um, a new view here for process stacks. So previously, this was a text box that had like a little bit of ad hoc formatting of the thread stack. And now he's turned it into this nice table um, with everything neatly organized in columns instead of just having a big text blob. So um, it looks a lot nicer than it did before. I think I actually even mentioned this in the last monthly update that uh, we could improve this further. And then he went and did it. So thank you very much, Rodrigo. Um, 
And something that I can't show you here, but has been going on a lot is uh, there's been a bunch of people working towards um, ARM64 support. Um, and it's the Nico started a port to Raspberry Pi. And uh, since then, a bunch of people have been joining and messing around with that. Now, I haven't played with that myself, so I'm not super familiar with the state of it. But uh, once we have something a bit more runnable, um, I'll make sure that, that we can demonstrate it to everybody. Um, I think that's going to be awesome. OK, so another random thing actually that I really liked was in Space Analyzer. So when you start up the Space Analyzer program, it actually it scans the entire file system to figure out what's using up all the space. And previously, it would just sit there and not show anything while that was happening. So you would start the program and then wait a few seconds, and then it would actually open a window and, and show the stuff. But now, thanks to uh, For Love of Cats, we have this thing, a progress window when you start up, poof. Much, much nicer, I think. Um, I'm a really big fan of showing loading progress instead of showing nothing. Uh, it's so frustrating when you, you're you pretty sure you started a program, but nothing is happening on the screen. So uh, super nice to have that thing. Also, it seems like I have the Git port installed, and it's taking up more space than anything else on the system. <laughs> That's a little bit concerning. Um, but I guess Git is large. Anyway, let's see some other thing. So in, uh, in Pixel Paint, there was some neat stuff. So Marco wanted to have a special uh, cursor for the bucket fill. So uh, he went ahead and made it possible to set a bitmap cursor. So it, like we, the system has a bunch of standard cursors, right? Like arrows, I-beams, crosses, and things like that. Um, hourglass. But uh, for something like a bucket fill, it doesn't really make sense as a generic system cursor. So um, Marco added a way to just set a, a custom bitmap cursor. So now any app that wants to set a custom cursor, they can just use this mechanism. And that's really neat. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's super cool. Um, outside of that, there's there's been stuff going on everywhere and i feel like I'm, I'm forgetting something but i always forget stuff in these videos um i know that there were a lot of cool optimizations in javascript and the regex engine that ali did and uh, i actually asked him if he could do them and he did so i want to <laughs> make sure i say thank you for that um and a lot of, like I mentioned the ARM64 port. So while I haven't messed with that personally, uh, I'm really, really pleased to see uh, the the work that's going on in the kernel to make it more generic and less x86 specific. So in order to support uh, the ARM64 port, it's, it's, finally, it's finally necessary to break out the x86 specific parts of various kernel components and put those into separate files and, uh, and actually make some, some good abstractions for that. And uh, that has been a really, really awesome part of the ARM64 work. Anyway, I, uh, I think that these were the, the main things I wanted to show you um, today. And um, currently, I'm personally working on a demo for the Handmade Seattle conference, which is on November 11 and November 12. Um, I'm presenting Serenity OS there in a, in a demo. So um, we'll see. Um, hopefully that becomes available eventually so that you can see it if you're, if you're not going to the conference. Uh, but for those of you who are, uh, I hope you will enjoy the demo. Anyway, um, that's it for today. So thank you all so very much for checking in and staying up to date with the project. If you want to come chat, then please join our Discord server. There's a link to that in the video description. And uh, I also nowadays host the weekly live stream here on YouTube. And it's every Friday at 4 PM Swedish time. And it's called the Serenity OS Office Hours. And you can just come there and we talk about whatever you want to talk about, any technical or non-technical question related to Serenity OS. Uh, so thank you again for checking in. and. 
I will see you all next time. Bye.